It's time to tune in to Defending the Faith with Frank Harbor. Hear the latest about religious liberty. A win for religious freedom in one of the remaining blockbuster cases facing the U.S. Supreme Court this term. A legal battle continues for the Little Sisters of the Poor for nearly a decade now. A street preacher armed with a speaker, a microphone, and a camera strapped to his chest is now banned from the village. Our founding fathers believed in the separation of church and state, but not for one fleeting moment. Did they believe in the separation of God and government? And powerful apologetics. Are you prepared to defend the faith? I'm convinced unless we trust in God, this nation is finished. We're facing a new kind of enemy. We're involved in a new kind of warfare. And we need the help of the Spirit of God. Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Defending the Faith, and I am Frank Harbour, and I'm your host. I am the president and the chief legal counsel for the Institute for Christian Defense, and if this is your first time tuning in, you can find us at defendingthefaith.law. Our ministry defends the faith, and we defend it in the legal arena. We have about 14 cases right now across the United States where we defend religious liberty, And uh, we're doing a case in Kentucky uh, that I've been involved with uh, this week. And uh, we have uh, several cases uh, across the country. We also defend the faith through apologetics and evangelism, which is going to get into what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, For 21 years of my life, I was an atheist and didn't believe in God and set out to prove that God did not exist, but found that there was powerful evidence that demonstrates that God is real and that Christianity is the truth, which kind of brings us into what we're going to be talking about today, because, you know, I wish that I had known about all of this, all of these powerful evidences when I was a child. And I can't even imagine what kind of difference it would have made if I would have been exposed to all the Christian evidences you know, why the Bible's true, how to know Jesus is God, how to know Jesus rose again from the dead. But to have heard it as a child, I think would be a giant difference making uh, event. And so today we've got a very special guest with us. We got Barry Williams. And for years, Barry was with uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship but in the last year, uh, he and uh, several other partners that he have has have started a new ministry called Next Generation Impact. And this is an exciting show because they are doing apologetics for children. And they're making an impact across the country in churches and in public schools. And we're going to hear all about that today. Barry, welcome to the show. Glad to have you. Thank you. It is uh, truly an honor to be here with you. And so Barry has come up today. We're we're recording this episode in South Lake, Texas, but he drove all the way up here from the greatest state in the union. You are correct. The state of Oklahoma, uh, where I was born, where many, many great people were born. And uh, I, I, I met him when I preached at First Baptist Ada with the great pastor Brad Graves. You think he's a pretty good guy? I do. I think he's a, a pretty incredible pastor. Oh, he's 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 amazing. I really really uh like that guy. And let's see Barry, you have a a wife and four kids, is that right? That's right. I have a wife and and four kids ranging from 18, actually today is our youngest birthday, all the way up through 26, which is our oldest daughter. Oh, that's out that's outstanding. And uh, so he's doing an incredible work across the country. So kind of give us your background. uh, Tell us, you know, how you got into ministry. And then we'll jump into this topic about apologetics for children, because you're going to want to hear this particularly uh, about how it can what we're going to talk about today can have an impact where you go to church. uh, But also, particularly if you're a pastor, this is a great strategy to to help your church in an incredible way. You're going to hear some things today that I think are just outstanding. Barry, uh, tell us your background and then lead into how you got into this. Okay. Um, Well, yeah. So I got an opportunity um, 
for, for the first 10, 15 years of, of my adult life, my, my two brothers and I traveled and we sang all across the, the country. Um, and in, in 2001, I was actually, I had just filled in at a small Baptist church in, in Oklahoma and, and, and did my part. I got up, I led music that night and I sat down in the front pew. And when I sat down, the, the pastor that night, who was a brand new pastor um, at First Baptist Medill, Oklahoma, actually was, he, he preached a message on the, the need for an intentional ministry to children. And when he preached that night, it was almost like God slapped me upside the head and said, that's what I have for you. And I went home that night and I actually began to pray about it and, and just continue to feel stronger and stronger about this idea of, 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 of speaking and, and preaching and teaching uh, to children. And so in 2001, I became a very part-time children's minister and then got an opportunity then to serve at, at two churches as their children's pastor and business administrator, um, pastored a church for a, for a short time, and then went back into children's ministry until the day where uh, it was 2019. Um, God just, uh, once again, it was one of those moments where um, it was almost like he said, you're doing a great job for these kids that are coming to our church. But what about the millions of kids across America that that do not have any idea who Christ is, don't have any idea who, who God is? And then at that moment was when I stepped away and began to work uh, uh, as state director for Child Evangelism Fellowship of Oklahoma. And then um, actually just a little over a year ago, actually in September of 2020, was when God began to speak to me and said, you know, we, we have to do more than just evangelize children. We also need to disciple them. But but then even more importantly, we need to to help them stand for their faith. We need to help them with, with the idea of apologetics. And um, so myself and a couple other partners from across the country stepped away and created Next Generation Impact. I also get the incredible opportunity to serve still in a, in a, in a church role as well at, at First Baptist Ada, where I serve as the next gen pastor there and get to kind of not just be in theory about what this looks like, but then also get to practice it. Um, but we're a family that loves kids. My wife teaches fifth grade uh, science. And then my, my, I have a daughter that's in children's ministry, a son that's praying about the mission field, a, another son that, that was a children's pastor and, and now gets an opportunity to do a myriad of things in ministry. And so uh, that's, that's just kind of who I am in, in a nutshell. Wow. This is exciting stuff because you know, young people, I remember when I was in a seminary, I went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And at the time, it was the largest seminary in the world. It was, it's a fabulous place. One of my students, Dr. Adam Greenway, is now the president. He's the ninth president of, of that uh, wonderful place. But I had an evangelism course with Dr. James Eves. And the lesson plan fell on one of the days and we talked about children and evangelism. And up until that point, I never really realized how important it was to make sure that children hear the gospel, even at a very early age, because some people take the approach that, Hey, you know, you don't even need to, you know, bother, you know, teaching a child until they reach the age of accountability, whatever that is. You know, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate about that. But, you know, some people are like, you know, you, you probably really shouldn't do anything with 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 children at an early age. But Dr. Eves presented a, a lesson and that's where uh, it was actually several uh, days of lessons where we talked about the importance of reaching children for Christ, because there comes a certain point where if the older you get, the less likely you are to receive Christ. Can you can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, I would love to. You know, there's there's this idea that that even in even in the secular world, they 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 really have come up with this idea that there's there's two distinct different types of learning. You have a cognitive learning, which is which is the knowledge base. It's 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 kind of those those things that we know. But then there's also the moral learning, and the moral learning really makes up who we are. Um, in our character, it also makes up what, how we make a decision based upon our faith. Um, it, it, it's it's those things from right and wrong. How do we know? And and the way to look at it is is really that there's two there's two windows that open up um, when a child is born. Um, that that cognitive window opens up at a very young age and really stays open the majority of their life. And that 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 really just helps them. They can means they can always gain new knowledge. We can always learn new facts and figures. 
But when you come to the moral window, it's completely different. And like I said, th th this has been done in, in the secular world and in, in the spiritual world where they understand that on the moral side, the spiritual side, that of faith and character, that that window opens up at a, at a young age, three, four years old. And it's wide open by the time a child's about seven, eight, nine years old. But then about the age of 14, that window begins to close. And when it gets to about 17, 18, 19, pretty much what, what a child is going to know, right from wrong, spiritual side, morals, character, all those things are going to be really um, decided by the time they're 17, 18. And it's the widest, when it's open, the, the widest is when a child is about five to, to 14. And so what we have to do is we have to, to make sure that we are intersecting the truth in a child's life during the, the, the time that that window is the widest open. Because past that point, we can still give them head knowledge, but the reality of them uh, really being changed at a heart level, a faith level, is, is, is pretty slim. And that's why we see so many um, statistics ranging anywhere from 70 to, to 90% of, of people that came to know Christ did so before their 18th birthday. So give us a picture of where we are uh, reaching children and churches, uh, you know, some of the stats or some of the numbers about the effectiveness of the church. You know, we know that churches across the country are declining, but there's there's probably a uh, good reason to think that if that is true, that we're not doing a good job on the battlefield of children. Yeah, uh, you know that's that's a question that that I get a chance to to talk about with people all the time, and uh, I I am a, a strong proponent of the local church, and in fact we don't consider ourselves um, the ministry that's going to come and fix everything. We believe that the local church is who God has placed within a community, and and we we see ourselves as just a start church strengthening partner to come alongside with strategy because. The reality is, is the last three generations that that have really been there, Gen Gen X and 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 the millennials, and then Gen Z. Those three, the the church attendance, or when they would when would typically um, get their spiritual spiritual upbringing, their spiritual knowledge, their their spiritual growth. Um, those three generations that the the church attendance has gradually gone less and less to where now they've considered those three generations as a post Christian generation, um, which means that now we're in a completely different generation, which is generation alpha, which are kids that have been born from 2010 to 2025, meaning the oldest is about 12 years old right now, and the youngest is yet to be born. That generation, they're, they're saying that, 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 that they are now a pre-Christian generation. And the reasoning is because um, though with church attendance in those previous three generations dropping off and off and off, now you have a generation of children who who have no um, idea of of spiritual matters. They know have no idea what the, even the church is for, the, and so it's a completely disengaged generation. You know, um, when the early church started taking the gospel out in the first century, they took the gospel to a pagan world that didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know that Jesus rose again from the dead. And so they had to prove up those facts. And of course, I'm an attorney. And so I go to court a lot of times and sometimes the other side doesn't show. But that doesn't mean you win. You still have to prove up your case. And so I do prove ups a lot. And, you know, what I feel like is, is that the church for the longest time has felt like it has a home field advantage because, you know, the time of the early church, they were so successful. The gospel rocked around the world and missionaries went, you know, to all the continents and, you know, this country that we live in, the United States of America uh, was, was founded with a lot of Christian fathers mm -hmm. uh, so much so that in God, we trust is on our money. And we, we pledge allegiance to the flag, one nation under God and, a lot of things that give us that home field advantage, but that's changing. Exactly. So we can't just assume that everybody knows these things, particularly children. We we think the children know the same stuff as the grandparents, but that's not true, is it? 
No, it, it, it's not true. And in fact, the the idea of the the Great Commission was to go ye into all the world. And the reality is, is we're in a we're in a period of time now where that is that is more important than ever because we've 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 kind of rocked along. And, and once again, I came from the church world where I where I've served in churches for my entire adult life. We we had this idea, especially in in communities where where we were the the thriving church, that we just expected people would come. And what's happened is we've had now two or three generations where they're not coming. And this then this the last couple of years, everybody knows what's taken place with this with this pandemic and everything. Church attendance has suffered tremendously. And unless we get outside the walls and begin to re-engage those people and begin to re-engage and really take the Great Commission seriously and get outside of our walls and go ye into into our community, then 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 our then our then our churches as we know it are are, are struggling because of that. We have to take that message seriously. And children are 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 we're seeing a generation of children right now that if you walk up and down the the the, the school hallways. They have no idea of, of Bible stories. They have no idea of who, who God is and what Christ is. Because for the last couple of generations, 80 to 85% now of children are unengaged with the church. They're not, they're, they've never darkened the door of a church. And so we have to begin to drastically think, what are we going to do? And so because of that, a lot of people know the statistic, churches are closing their doors every month. And in fact, uh, Lifeway Research did, did, a, did a, a, a study back in 2019 that 4,500 churches closed their doors among 34 different uh, denominations and only 3,000 were planted. So mm. we're losing, we're losing traction. And if you were to ask any one of those churches, I believe that closed their doors, why they closed their doors, they would say, we didn't reach the next generation. Every single time. And so now we're going to have people that are listening to this program. Some are going to be pastors and they're going to be like, Hey, we got a children's program, but it's more like, you know, um, babysitting is probably not the, the best word, but I mean, something like that they're occupying, but we're not making any ground. So you guys are addressing this. Tell us what to do. Okay. And, and I would take what you just said and, and, and a lot of times in the children's ministry world, in the church, we, we even, I would even go a step further than what you said. And uh, I think we do, we do a pretty good job with the kids that come to us. Mm-hmm. We, we have programming set up for the kid, but the reality is, is 80 to 85% of those kids are not coming in America. So what we've done is we really strive to, to create a strategy and we're not a one size fits all for a church. When we sit down with a church pastor, we help look at, at their, their own particular, uh, um, their own particular community they're in, what they're doing already. But then we develop a, we've developed a strategy to, to help them get outside their walls. And so one of the, the big key components that we do are what we call impact nights. These are, these are nights where, where communities can come together, churches can come together within a community and do an all out um, just outreach for kids and their families. I mean, we do a lot of those things um, for junior high and high school kids, and then especially for adults with 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 different kinds of evangelistic rallies but we believe that we need to start earlier and so we we help you create that event where where you're able to bring those churches together and then our key component is is the idea of getting into the public school a lot of people don't realize that that it's it's legal for a church to go into a public school and to carry out um, what we call an impact club which is a, which is a bible club on school campus um, because of the equal Ac- access act the Equal Access Act says that if a school allows their outside groups in their community, such as Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H, all those different things, if they allow those clubs to, to use their campus after hours, then they, they have to allow faith-based organizations as well. So what we do is we begin to walk alongside the church to help create the relationship that needs to happen, make sure they do it legally, and make sure that they, they honor that relationship and then, and then we help them to set up one of those impact clubs on their local campus where a child's going to hear not just evangelistically, but what we love about it is they're going to hear what it, what it means to be a disciple of Christ so that they can grow in their faith. And then they're also going to hear some very strong apologetic lessons in everything we do, such as who is God? Is God's word for real? Is it 100% accurate? And then we're going to take them on those apologetic lessons where they're going to be able to not only hear about Christ, but learn to live for him and then how to stand firm in their faith 
when the culture and the world around them is telling them something so drastically different that they should bow down to. So uh, public schools now that probably sounds intimidating for some people listening, particularly, you know, if you're a pastor, like how would how would I do that? How would I, I, I how would we get in there? What would we do? And Barry, uh, we got you on the show today. You're that guy. This is what you do. So so tell everybody what you do. OK, you're the guy. Yeah. So we 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 literally start out the the relationship and the conversation where one of our representatives from from whatever area that, that they are in. We have that conversation with the school district to make sure that we get permission for them. So we help them. We, we help get permission from the school district to do this so that when the church that we that we walk into, um, that's already been taken care of. Then we don't want this to be any uh, a stumbling block for anybody. So what we do is we come alongside you and first we're going to equip you and train you and give you all the training that you need so that you know how to do it and not only know, know how to do it, but do it well, how to, how to minister to a child on the public school campus, what you can do legally, what you can't do legally, all those things. We take care of all that. And then we're going to take it a step further. We don't want to be just a vendor of the church where we're selling curriculum to you. So all the resources that we create when a church says that, hey, we want to do this in our community, we give you access to to all of our curriculum and you have access to, do, to, to teach all of our curriculum. And it doesn't cost the church a penny. It doesn't cost the church a penny to do to do anything we do. And so what we're just what we need is just a church in every community that says, hey, we want to reach every kid in our community. And then we walk alongside you to make sure that you're comfortable, make sure that you know how to do it, and then how to, to really honor that relationship and love on that school well and care for that school well so that there is no gray area. Um, and, and so we've just seen some tremendous results because of that. So you guys are a great commission organization. We've been called to go there for and take the gospel, you know, to the ends of the earth. But we have to be intelligent about this and realize that there are different ages of people and have, you know, different strategies. And I think there's a lot of people, they get excited and like, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to charge the gates of hell and they take a water pistol. Well, I mean, you could do that, <laughs> you know, and, and excitement will get you so far. But, you know, instead of taking a water pistol, you could take a bazooka. So this strategy that you have with apologetics and children, I think is very unique. I think, I think what we're talking about today is very key to kingdom growth and, and churches uh, because uh, apologetics, um, you're turning these kids into evangelists, very effective uh, evangelists to reach the alpha generation because an alpha is probably one of the best people to reach another alpha. That's right. That's right. In fact, I say this all the time. I feel like we've been successful when we raise up missionaries on those school campuses. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will say, oh, are you talking about the adults that go in and teach the club? And I said, no, we're talking about the children that are becoming missionaries on their school campus because those kids can can have conversations not just within the confines of that club where it's legally, those kids can have conversations anytime, any place, any way. And if we can raise up a generation that are comfortable in sharing their faith, comfortable in, in standing for their faith and be able to, to know what's right, what's wrong, what's biblical, what's unbiblical, know what truth is, what is not true. If we can raise up that kind of generation, we can raise up a generation that I believe can ultimately change this country. And that's what our desire is. And, you know, it's, it's part of the strategy because, you know, you, you, you have evangelism, but then you're talking about apologetics. But apologetics bridges the gap because it is one side of apologetics is evangelism and the other side is discipleship. Right. Right. That's right. We, we want those kids to, to grow in their faith. And it's kind of a, a circular thing. We want to evangelize towards discipleship and we want to discipleship. We want to disciple towards evangelism. So if we're discipling towards evangelism, we're raising up a generation that is now becoming evangelists and missionaries on their campus. And then all that and that whole thing serves kind of under, under an umbrella of apologetics, of understanding what they believe and why they believe it. And that's and that's really what we're what we're striving to do with every child that we get in front of. And so that curriculum is based that way. It's, it's written that way. 
So it's not it's not a difficult task if if a, if a, one of your listeners is sitting here saying, how in the world do I how do I in the world do I teach apologetics to a to a 10 year old? That's what we're here for. We want to help walk them through every step and give them all the tools they need to do that. You know, I'm sitting here, you know, listening to this conversation and just thinking, I wonder how important it is for the kingdom of God. Um, of course, I'm an evangelist and I've done crusades across the country. I traveled for 10 years with Dr. Billy Graham and watched him, you know, win thousands and thousands of people uh, to the Lord. But in what we're talking about today, some people would bypass what we're talking about today because they go, oh, that's children. Oh, that's kids. And they, they tend to, to, to brush this aside to the sidelines. And it could be that very attitude is the, the sickness that we have because you, you, you look at Jesus' attitude toward children. He didn't brush them aside, did he? No. He accepted them. And then he gave us pretty stern warnings to any one of those that makes a child stumble. Yeah. And so he knew the heart of a child was very important. And, 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 and it should be that important to, to us as, as believers. So is it, you know, cause when we look at the, the strategy with the child, um, we should probably be exposing them to antidotes because they're getting poisoned out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're under attack from all of these different secular bombs out there. So if they, they need the antidote, so where are they going to get it? Because I just don't know. I mean, that's where y'all come in, and I'm excited about this new ministry. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I, I, so many times I, I'm drawn back to Scripture of instances such as Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. We see these guys, and we focus on these three young men who were able to stand mm -hmm. in adversity. They were able to stand when they were when 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 a statue was put in front of them to bow down to. They didn't bow. But we never look at the people that are around them with their face in the mud. Ugh. The people with the face in their mud. Mm -hmm. You see, those three young men were taught by a strong Jewish family. They then get transplanted in, transplanted into Babylon, where they then know how to stand. But these others, a lot of them, they didn't know the one true God. It's not like they were bad people. They just didn't know any better. This was just something else for them to bow down to. So with children in our society today, it's not that they're bad kids. But when society or culture throws something at them and tells them to bow down to it, they bow mm -hmm. because culture around them. But it's because they don't have any truth to set it, to, to set it against. So if we can intersect that truth at the right time, we can give them a basis of what to stand on. Then we have that opportunity. And, and I tell people all the time, it's not like we even have, as believers, we don't, we don't even have an option for this. These kids are not coming to our churches right now. No. We have to do something about it. That's our, that's our role. Because they don't have any upbringing, spiritual-wise, in their home. So when the world is, we can't just go And These are the leaders of our country. Mm -hmm. These are the, the ones that in, in, in 10, 12 years, they're going to be leading our country. And if we don't give them a strong biblical foundation, we can't sit back and complain about it. We have to go do it. We have to go share with them. And that's, that's why I'm so passionate about it. You know, I think, too, if we don't do what we're talking about today, these people will disappear and we'll never see them again. I, I, totally, I totally agree. About the time they get out of their parents' house, poof. Yeah, because if they don't, the, the one thing we had going for us in future generations was they were at least exposed some. Their parents might take them on Easter. They had grandparents that might take them. Now you're looking at two, three, they're three generations removed. So they don't even have grandparents that have taken them or exposed them to anything um, when it comes to biblical, biblical worldview. They have nothing. And so the, the, what we did at least have going for us is when that those kids would go off, they would, they might do, they might fall away, but a lot of them would come back because they at least had somewhat of an upbringing. We don't, they have, there's no hope for that because they don't have any of that. So but, the chances of them coming back, I, I, they're, they're nothing to come back to because yeah. they weren't ever a part of it. 
yeah, they were never locked in. And uh, think about what the Bible says about the armor of God, Mm -hmm. which is designed to, you know, uh, block the fiery darts of Satan, which come at us through the world. And he has different darts for different areas, you know, but the first piece of armor that we're told to put on is the belt of truth. And you mentioned that a second Mm -hmm. ago, because this whole thing is a battle for the truth, isn't it? That's right. And, and that belt, that belt of truth is what everything else hangs on. Mm -hmm. Every decision they ever make is going to hang on whatever their belt of truth is. And if that belt of truth is a secular worldview truth, it's ever changing. And so they, it, it comes and goes as they, as the world throws it. But if they have a, a belt of truth grounded in God's word, now they have something they can, they can hang every decision and every hope on. And they can, and I teach kids all the time that when, when the world and God's word come in conflict, God's word wins every time. Mm-hmm. But if you take God's word away from them, this is all they have. And this is their belt of truth. And that's why Barna put out a study not too long ago. Said seventy four percent of this these last couple of generations have uh, the, their their worldview is is moral relativism, whatever whatever the world says, and the world is is in direct conflict with God's word on so many topics. Well, this has been an amazing episode of defending the faith. I think it's one of the most important ones that we've ever done because it's just undeniable how important the next generation is and the strategy of those of us who call Jesus Lord to figure out how we're going to help the alpha generation be, be, be the generation. I think we're getting closer and closer to the return of Christ. And I think that next generation impact is one of the most important ministries in the United States of America. And it's been a blessing to have uh, Barry Williams on this show. And I know there are people who are watching and listening who want to know how to get a hold of him and this organization. Where can we find all these details? Yeah, one of the, probably the the easiest, easiest way to get a hold of us is through our, through our website. It's nextgenerationimpact.org. And, uh, or you can, you can, you can reach out to, to us via email, which is info, I-N-F-O, at nextgenerationimpact.org. And realistically, Frank, if, if, if the listener is an individual who says, man, I think our church needs to look at this, then reach out to us. On the website, you can, you can click on Get Involved. And when you click on Get Involved, it's going to give you the different options. If you are a church and you're a pastor and you say, hey, this is something we want to do, we have on our site next steps for churches. Um, because once again, we are a church strengthening organization. We want this to be all about you there in your community. So click on next steps for churches. And financially, if someone wants to, 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 to partner with us financially, you can go to, to once again on our site there and just say give now. And it gives you all those opportunities to be able to, to partner with us. Our goal is to, to reach every kid in America, to give every child in America the opportunity um, to set its hope on God. And to do that, it takes, it takes churches and individuals all across the country to, to, to really be the leader um, for your area. So get in touch with us and we will do whatever we can to, to walk alongside you to make that a reality. That is so awesome. So I hope you'll be in contact with them. Also, remember that we have a free book that's available right now. It's called Objection Overruled, How to Respond to the Top 10 Objections to Christianity. And you get a free copy of that at our website at defendingthefaith.law. We appreciate you listening. God bless you. And we will see you in the next episode.